Hello again, I'm Chuck Todd and welcome to another edition of Meet the Press Reports. It's been 54 years since we first landed astronauts on the moon. And today, America is in another space race. Not just back to the moon, but using the moon to then go to Mars. It's a rare moment that also means bipartisan support, big budgets, and a mission to go big. But while the first space race was with the Soviet Union, this one is with China. And there's even a third player in the mix, SpaceX founder Elon Musk, and he aims to beat both countries to Mars. Tom Costello covers space for us here at NBC News. He's done a ton of reporting on China's space ambitions. So, Tom, NASA thinks it can get astronauts, human beings, on the on Mars in less than two egg, uh, decades. A, is it doable? And are they going to do it before China does it? NASA says within 17 years, and that's the big question. NASA and Elon Musk believe it is possible. Outside experts are skeptical. China is now focused on landing its astronauts on the moon for the first time, maybe one day Mars. Is Mars doable? NASA says yes. And we were stunned to find out that to get to Mars, NASA plans to go nuclear. Boca Chica, Texas, April 20th, 2023. To the cheers of SpaceX staffers, Starship clears the tower as it roars off the launch pad. Booster after chamber pressure is nominal. A critical first test of the biggest rocket ever built, with twice the thrust of the Saturn V rockets that lifted Apollo astronauts to the moon. Going through the period of maximum aerodynamic pressure. They'll need the power if Starship is to one day send astronauts to the moon and eventually Mars. But only three minutes into flight, the rocket booster failed to separate. Then four minutes into flight, ground controllers hit the self-destruct button. The crowd cheered that Starship had gotten this far. Seated in the control room, Elon Musk had warned the chances of success were really only 50-50. Starship just experienced what we call a rapid unscheduled disassembly. Not only did it disassemble, the force of the rocket destroyed the launch pad itself. Yet despite a bad start, both SpaceX and NASA insist they're committed to Starship. First to land astronauts on the moon, but ultimately to carry astronauts to Mars as soon as 2040, eventually building human colonies. In 2021, Elon Musk told me humanity must reach for Mars and beyond if we are to survive. I think it's important that humanity become a multi planet species and that we extend consciousness and life as we know it uh, beyond Earth. And there's another motivator, China. U.S. generals warn China appears determined to create a military presence in space, starting with the lunar surface. It's already built a robotic base on the far side of the moon, with plans to land its own astronauts by 2030. On Mars, only the U.S., Russia, and China have successfully landed robotic rovers, but the U.S. has had far more success. Washington State Democratic Congressman Adam Smith is the ranking member on the Armed Services Committee. Is it imperative that the U.S. gets to Mars before Russia or China? You know, China's a major power, we're a major power. Um, if we stumble into conflict, that has huge negative implications for the entire planet um, and for space as well. But in the short term, yeah, we, we need to be competitive here. China, I think, is very aggressive. President Xi Jinping has made it clear uh, that he thinks that the U.S. is a disappearing power and he wants to replace us. So that competition is real in a lot of places, and certainly it's real in space. Uh, it's real in the race for the moon and the, in the race for Mars. Now NASA is preparing to send astronauts back to the moon and eventually Mars, but faster. A round trip mission to Mars could take two to three years. Just keeping a crew fed would be a massive challenge. Then there's the risk of prolonged exposure to fatal doses of space radiation. So to cut the travel time, America is going back to the future. This project was called NERVA, Nuclear Engine for Rocket Vehicle Applications. To the 1960s and a government program most Americans have never heard of to develop nuclear powered rockets. Someday a manned trip to Mars and return may become the mission assignment. It turns out they made big progress back in the 60s, running big expensive tests. 
These tests will complete the technology for a nuclear rocket engine. DARPA. Fast forward to today, and NASA and a Pentagon department called DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, are going back to their grandfather's programs 50 plus years ago. Three, two, one, boosters in ignition, and liftoff of Artemis 1. The goal, sending astronauts to the moon and beyond on nuclear rockets. Look at the, the clarity of this. Look, this is a star nursery. This is the cosmic soup that creates stars. And NASA stars chief Bill rejected. Nelson. Future missions will have international astronauts. We go openly back to the moon and then to Mars. The Chinese government is very secretive and a lot of their plans uh, involve their military preparations. And so there's a reason for us to get there first. And that's what we're gonna do. Why go nuclear? Because from the earliest days of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo to Artemis and SpaceX, rockets have relied on liquid fuel, which burns up quickly. When the Apollo astronauts went to the moon, they needed five of these massive F-1 engines just to get them off the Earth and escape the Earth's gravitational pull. Seven and a half million pounds of thrust. Here at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, they've got an exact replica to scale of the Saturn V, 363 feet tall. Future astronauts will need that kind of lift, but once they're in space, they can use a much smaller engine, a nuclear engine, to go all the way to Mars and back, a fraction of the size, and that engine could last 20 years. Wow, this is a big place. It's happening now at the Marshall Test Flight Center in Huntsville. It's not just theory. So what is this here? This is, this is a nuclear test chamber. This is where they put components of nuclear thermal rockets such as this fuel element here and like the one that you're holding. These are the building blocks for America's future nuclear propulsion going to space. Yes. DARPA program manager Dr. Tabitha Dodson has pulled out the old blueprints and dusted off the test engines from the 1960s. But in the early 70s, the government canceled the program amid public concern about nuclear safety. Fast forward to today and an added geostrategic imperative. We need to look at what does the United States have which gives us that leap ahead advantage over our adversaries and our near peers. The Chinese? The Chinese and, and others. So we don't want to be on par with, with, our, um, with our adversaries. We want to be ahead of them. We're, and we have the means to do so. And this is it, nuclear? Yes. Energy from fission. Is and it turns out the U.S. appears to be light years ahead with nuclear rockets. Today, Dr. Stephanie Tompkins leads DARPA, created after Russia's Sputnik satellite caught America by surprise. Well, the, the technology from the 60s never was given a chance to achieve its full potential. So a lot of amazing work went into it. When I go back and I read the reports from those days, I am um, continually reminded that we all get to stand on the shoulders of giants. For the first time, men from Earth will set foot on another planet. Today's nuclear rocket program, called DRACO, is different. Inside the rocket, a small nuclear reactor with graphite elements. Rather than using weapons-grade uranium, it uses high-assay, low-enriched uranium, common in research reactors, and capable of generating tremendous heat. Liquid hydrogen moves through the channels in the core, heating to 4,000 degrees. That gas is then shot through a nozzle to provide thrust. 330,000 gallons of fuel to fire for 30 minutes for a mission to Mars. A nuclear rocket's much smaller propellant tank, able to carry much heavier cargo, traveling faster and further. So using nuclear thermal propulsion, it'll cut down travel time by at least a third of the time. So that's cutting days out of the trip to the moon and months out of the trip to Mars. Yes, exactly. That's valuable time. It is. Can we sustain human life in a crew all the way for two years the first time we go to Mars? That's pushing it. So if we can get there faster, then that's what we need to do. And that's what this nuclear propulsion will do. And it's safe. 
NASA and DARPA insist the rocket's nuclear thermal reactor will never be tested here on Earth. So the Draco test will happen in space, the first since the 1970s, scheduled now for 2026 at a safe distance from Earth. If there were any sort of an, an, a nuclear accident in space when you're testing this, could that radiation come down to Earth? No. So we have chosen our altitude such that we are far away enough from the Earth, and the farther away you get from the Earth, the longer you stay in space, that we will stay put in space long enough such that those radiation products will never uh, make their way back to Earth. For hundreds of years, For they would stay in years. space. Yes. Okay, but how likely is it that humans, Americans, will actually travel to Mars by 2040, as NASA suggests? And do we really need to send humans to Mars? As an astrophysicist, we figured out some decades ago that I, I could send you or I can send a robot <laughs> to this destination. America's best known astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson is skeptical. I'm all for people in space, but to accomplish scientific goals, the robot can live off of sunlight and you can't. The robot is not gonna cry because we ran out of money and we can't bring it back. You don't see this happening in the near term. Correct, unless there's a geopolitical force operating, such as what happened with Sputnik, okay? What would that be? China says, leak a memo saying they want to put military bases on Mars. We're there in 12 months. <laughs> Three months to fund, design, build the spaceship, nine months to take it there. But Elon Musk is all in. We need to get Starship operational in order to uh, have a base on the moon and be able to send people to Mars. Musk has plans to build a colony on Mars. Back in 2021, he talked about his hope for his starship to carry humans to the moon and then the red planet. Because gravity on Mars is just a third of Earth's gravity, a rocket would not need as much power to return to Earth. Musk's plan is to reuse rockets just like airplanes. The risk is, is not zero. This is a, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to accelerate, put so much energy in something and then take it out on the return. It's a very hard thing. So it's one of the hardest things. So you just can't get to zero risk. We'll do everything we can to get as close as possible to zero risk. Just as Sputnik lit the fire for America's space program, China's ambitions may be having a similar effect today. The fact that we now have a very aggressive competitor I think all the more makes it a space race. You know, Tom, the whole premise of a show you and I both uh, enjoy, uh, fictional show, alternative history for all mankind, it's sort of the point the show makes, the same yeah. point Bill Nelson is making, same point that Neil uh, Tyson made to you, which is, you know, we lose the race to the moon in that show, spoiler alert, um, and suddenly it motivates us to do even more. Yeah. Sounds like we wouldn't be doing any of this if China wasn't interested in going to space. Uh, they, they clearly are a presence uh, in that space already between mm -hmm. the moon and Earth. It's called cislunar. It's right. almost like the highway to the moon. Right. They've already got a robotic base on the far side of the moon. And the concern is if they were to somehow gain a foothold in cislunar and, and they become the gatekeeper right. and decide who goes to the moon, right. that could be a real strategic concern. Now, that's a big reason why we are so intent on going to the moon and then maybe to Mars. And the whole point... To get to Mars, we've got to essentially win the basing race to the moon, right? Like, we're, we're, we're colonizing the moon because that's the only way we're going to get to Mars, right? Yeah, it takes such tremendous amount of energy, of rocket thrust, to break through the Earth's gravitational pull. Once you get to the moon, which has a very, very minimal amount of gravity, from there you create your base, you go on to Mars. So it is a much more efficient way of doing so. But importantly, if in fact the moon has water, mm -hmm. ice like we believe, yeah. they can use that not just for drinking water, but for rocket fuel. And from there, you're off to the races. But that's before we're talking nuclear. Now we're talking nuclear. It seems like we're so in a hurry to get to Mars, but isn't there a lot to be done on the moon? I mean, you could argue there's, there's, a lot. A, there's we could spend decades trying to frankly, exploit the resources of the moon. Oh, and I think we will. And you didn't ask me, but do I think we're going to be in Mar at <laughs> Mars like by 2040? Doesn't sound like you do you? I think it's unlikely that we'll be on the surface of Mars by 2040. We'll have more robotic bases and probes, yeah. 
unlikely we right. will be there. But when we hang out at the retirement home in 2060 yeah. down in down in Florida, are we going to be watching these rockets go to the moon so that they go to Mars? We're going to uh, see I Mars. Th if you and I are blessed to live that long, yeah. I think there's a good chance that by maybe 2060 or so, maybe we'll get the first human on Mars. All right. That's my gut. That's my gut. Tom Costello, the best beat at NBC. Good to see you, buddy. It is. All Coming right. up, why the U.S. believes it is so important to get to Mars first, especially when we haven't even finished exploring the moon. Stick with us. Welcome back. In 1969, it was an enormous source of pride for the United States that the first person to set foot on the moon was an American. But was that mission worth more than bragging rights? And are we racing to Mars more for pride than for science? So let's discuss all this. Adam Frank is professor of astrophysics at the University of Rochester, and he's author of the upcoming book, The Little Book of Aliens. And Jana Maleko-Smith, senior associate with the Aerospace Security Project and Strategic Technologies Program with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. So let's start with that first basic question here. Professor Frank, let me start with you. Uh, getting to Mars, is it simply for bragging rights or is there, is, is, is there a for all mankind type of mission here? Yeah, I think we want to step back a little bit and, and ask ourselves, you know, put this into history. 200 years ago, right, no human being had traveled faster than, uh, you know, 40 miles an hour on a horse unless they were falling to their death from a cliff, mm -hmm. right? And now there's a million people at any moment in, on airplanes, right, going 500 miles an hour. The a profound transformation in human culture that happened because of the technology, starting with the rail, um, is an analogy to 200 years from now, no matter who gets there, the transformation of becoming really a solar system-wide uh, species. You know, it's within 200 years, it's easy to imagine millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people living um, in space. And so really, when they look back, they'll look back on this moment, the way we look back on the first railroad lines being, yeah. being put down. So this is really, this is the direction humanity will take if we get past climate change and all the other crises. And John, I, look, uh, it does feel as if the real imperative to do this now is worth thinking in terms of national security as much as bragging rights, correct? There is certainly a geopolitical competition aspect to this thread in that the United States is leading the, the frontier at the cutting edge in developing technology to help support exploration of Mars and also be demonstrating what does it mean to be a good steward of space. This is an opportunity to work with allies and partners to promote responsible norms in outer space, addressing other tangential issues such as orbital debris, simply known as space junk. Mm -hmm. So that is one component, but the other aspect of that is also the scientific exploration here to help unlock some of the mysteries of the origin and evolution of life and also Mars potentially being a future planet that could help be the key to survival of humanity. Let me uh, ask this. Why, why the focus on Mars, Jana, when we haven't, you know, you hear this actually, sometimes we've, we've explored more of space than we have our own oceans, but let's stick with the moon versus Mars. We've barely explored the moon, and it feels like we ought to spend the rest of this century doing that, no? That's a fair point. I would walk us back to looking at some of the history around the policy of this particular issue, specifically Space Policy Directive 1, issued by former President Trump, that directed NASA to develop a innovative and sustainable program for lunar exploration and also Mars and other deep space exploration efforts. So the language of that Space Policy Directive also helped inform NASA's National Space Exploration Campaign, and the report that was published in 2018 has five pillars. The fifth pillar of that expressly references the need to promote exploration for Mars. The fourth pillar of that talks about lunar exploration. Uh, the third as well, yeah. the, the, uh, speaking to robotic missions, and then the second about space operations beyond cislunar lunar space, and the first component of that uh, five pillar strategy yeah. is looking at the transition of human space exploration, how to work with commercial partners in right. this area to help promote uh, NASA's exploration, because the International Space Station, it's aging, 
and the right. Biden administration has pledged to extend the technical lifespan of the ISS through the end of 2030, and that leaves a void. And it's important that we're strategic in thinking how we sure. fill that void now in partnering with the private sector. Look, I, I get on that front, Adam, to, to get to the moon, but we're spending an awful lot of money to try to figure out how to get humans to Mars. When, as Neil Tyson sort of made the point, you know, we're probably better off, it'd be cheaper to get more robots there, cheaper to do sort of that kind of exploration, while we wait for the technology to catch up so that it does become safer to get humans to Mars. It, that, that seems more logical, but it's not as sexy. Um, well, I also think there's another reason to Mars that we haven't talked about. There's no life on the moon, right? There's no question of astrobiology on the moon. The moon's a right. dead world. Mars was a blue world four billion years ago. Talk about climate change, right? Mm -hmm. This was a world that had an atmosphere um, for, for you know, at least probably half a billion years. So I, I, I don't think robots can do what human astronauts okay. can do when it comes to asking, like, what may be the most profound question ever. Are we the only time that life has happened? So right. Mars is the place, the best place in the solar system to look for the possibility of life. And that part of scientific exploration. So that you feel like has to be human. It has to be human. I think that robots can do a lot, yeah. but probably unless we get really lucky, you know, that the robot is able to hit the right place, right. Um, you know, you're really going to need boots on the ground to sort of make these sort of decisions on the fly and do things, you know, uh, ad hoc. Uh, not guessing here, but what do you think is something that you know Mars is going to teach us? Um, well, on, on a couple different levels, I think actually Mars is going to teach us about living in space. As I've said, you know, the, 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 the long-term future for humanity is trying to build biospheres, right? Mm -hmm. Our artificial biospheres. Um, and Mars is going to be the place. Uh, asteroids are another. I think we haven't really talked about the possibility of building space. My, we just published a paper on this, that you can turn asteroids into space cities. But Mars will be the first place we really learn how to um, use a planet that has the right amount of gravity that mm -hmm. you know, will actually be comfortable for humans to build artificial ecosystems that we can live in with you know, maybe you know, thousands of people. And this is the near term. Is there anything else in our solar system besides what you just said there, which is the idea of where we might have floating cities? On, on, is it on comets? Or not on comets, on, a, on, on asteroids. asteroids that, yeah. that, um, not, I don't want to get into that, but it sounds like if, what, if they don't have a gravitational pull, how do, you, how do you not just float away? Well, what we showed was is that you yeah. could take an asteroid, hollow it out, and then spin it up. Mm. And then you live on the inside, on the spinning inside. And there's thousands of asteroids. Mm -hmm. And each asteroid, you could have Manhattan, basically, the same size of population that Manhattan has. So there's a lot of real estate potential out there. All right. Jana, there's another part of this whole uh, space race that it does seem like... Look, I understand from a geopolitical sense why we're competing with each other, but it does seem like a waste of resources that the private sector, NASA, uh, and China are essentially competing against each other. I do think Elon Musk and, and NASA are, are probably as much cooperative as they are competitive, but are we holding ourselves back by competing? I... I don't see it that way in that this being a novel form of competition and I'll explain what I mean by that that since the the early 1960s there's been a a competition to pursue space exploration and I'm thinking um, specifically of Mars with the United States uh, Mariner 4 spacecraft which was the first to take photographs of Mars and uh, in 1965 and shortly thereafter uh, the Soviet Union being the first t uh, nation to do a soft landing of their spacecraft um, uh, uh, Mars 3 mm -hmm. on the surface of Mars, losing uh, transmission shortly thereafter. But if we look, history is a very helpful guidebook here to look at the the, the space race competition that we're seeing play out, playing out now, and how other how that has been that's been present at the very beginning. Uh, but there's two ways that we can look at it: that we can either bemoan the competition aspect of it, mm -hmm. or also see areas of potential uh, collaboration here. To use a, a popular adage by Abraham Lincoln, we can either rejoice that thorns have flowers yeah. or lament that flowers have thorns. So I see that here in how the, um, the, the United States is working with allies and partners to help build relationships to pursue deep space exploration. NASA's Artemis program, the Global Space Initiative, is a huge component yeah. of that. Adam, I want to close with this, which is are we, um, should we have already been where we are right now? Meaning, you know, we, we went through this dead period of the space program, at least publicly. 
I think the Challenger accident's the obvious inflection point that happened uh, in, in 86, and it seems as if everything, it didn't technically grind to a halt, but it felt like it did. You think we lost two decades, three decades um, of, of, you know, where should we, which, should we have been landing a rover 20 years ago? Uh, you know, that's a really interesting question because there's two answers to it. One is absolutely, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, 50 years, yeah. what were we thinking? People dreamed of going to the moon since the Greeks, and then we got there and we're like, yeah, we don't and need to We're done. Anymore. Yeah, like, what right. the heck? Right. Yeah. But on the other hand, you know, the, outlet mall? the technology, yeah. in some sense, by waiting this long, we allowed computer technology, we allowed. Um, uh, um, uh, 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 understanding of materials Mm -hmm. to get to the point where we could do things that we couldn't do back then. So, right, we could bemoan it, but I also see that um, the private sector, which we really need to talk about, the commercial uh, exploitation, so to speak, presence in space, is really what's going to drive a lot of that long future. And that probably required waiting a bit and getting these new technologies. Well, as Jana just pointed out, you're... So what if your flower has a few thorns? <laughs> That's right. uh, and Sean Gotta and do what Adam, you, do. <laughs> you two were terrific. That's all we have for Meet the Press reports this week. Thanks for being here. Next week, we're going to explore the art of a grift from billion-dollar startups that scam investors to lying about, well, just about everything to win a seat in Congress. Grifter Nation. That's next week on Meet the Press reports. And, of course, I'll see you this Sunday on Meet the Press. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.